you requested him. We've looked at all the comments. Uh, you, you just go by the acronym JJP. He is here. Jack Joseph Puig is in the house. What house? Pensado's place. Let's roll it. Hi, guys. You know Herb and I are usually pretty loose today. I might be a little nervous because I got my buddy Jack Joseph on. We've been friends now for probably, oh my God, 15 years maybe? It's been a while. But I can't tell you how much I've looked forward to having Jack on. Uh, when, I, when, I first <laughs> when I first came up with a concept for the show with Herb, uh, Jack was the first person, one of the first people I asked to be on the show. And I've just been so nervous. We've been putting it off, and Jack is so kind. He always says, "Man, whatever you want, whatever you want." So Jack's on the show today. Uh, we uh, we had a great day yesterday that I'm going to tell you about, and you'll understand why I brought up the past. Uh, what am I forgetting, Herb? Nothing. Keep going. <laughs> oh, Jack's going to be our batter's box. We got a little, little surprise for him today in batter's box. We got Drew over there. Uh, still trying to get laid over there, Drew. Is it any <laughs> success yet? Uh, we'll talk about it later. Okay. <laughs> that means that means no. That means no. <laughs> well, he's been he's been you know, of course everybody knows Drew's my assistant, so I, I know poor poor kid's been working his butt off lately. We've been mixing a lot. So well, you know what we should do then is make sure we talk about how to get to us so somebody can get to Drew and help out the issues he has. <laughs> um, you certainly can get us at our Twitter handle, which is at Pensado's Place. Um, you can email us at Pensado's Place at ThisWeekend.com. Uh, our YouTube channel is full, thanks to you guys. Facebook is another place. Uh, the guys will throw up the page with all the information, so make sure you get your comments and stuff to us. Um, and then we also have the result of a very cool dinner we had about a month ago, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so we got a, a cool new strategic relationship with Vintage King. Yeah. Right? Man. Tell them about the dinner we had, how cool it was. We had dinner with Chevy. Well, right. you had you had the fries. You had the, the full platter. There you go. You had the number one combo. Right. right. And, uh, man, it, uh, that restaurant was really kind of neat. Uh, what was it called? Called the Lux. Lux. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the first time I've eaten there, but... Uh, we were with Chevy from Vintage King, and uh, we were pretty excited when uh, when we reached out to them, or they reached out to us. I guess kind of they reached out to us, and uh, I couldn't pick a better group of people to be involved with. They have the same philosophies you and I have. They have the same interests you and I have. Uh, if you've ever dealt with with them, which I have a lot, uh, they're one of us. I mean, they know how to take care of you service-wise. Uh, you buy a used piece of gear from them, you get a one-year warranty, you get access to, I think they've got like seven or eight full-time techs just mm -hmm. just for their refurbished vintage gear. Mm -hmm. um, then, then they only handle the, the, the best lines. But uh, I, I, talked, uh, I talked recently, I was um, putting my little home studio together, and uh, man, I was so confused about what converters to get, you know, and uh, their website actually <clears throat> helped me make a, a pretty involved, a pretty uh, in intellectual decision, and I'm I'm happy with the choices I made just from information I got off of their website. So well, I'm I'm happy, and that's that's you know well, just like I, just like B B A E absolutely. And, and B A E was a company that that I use their stuff, I love, and that's going to be the benchmark for the show. So don't anybody panic. Uh, they're on our side. They're going to help you out. Uh, we, we, we've got a lot of good things planned with them. The other cool thing is that they will be available in the corner office in the chat room to answer any of our questions or any of your questions about gear and or what that. That will be a constant feature now of corner office. So we're looking to do some cool integration with them. We're honored to be involved with them because part, as Dave pointed out, part of what is really important is that we try to keep this at really gold standard brand, gold standard guests, and to have gold standard relationships says a lot about your involvement with the show as an audience and how you've helped us grow. So let's get it going because uh, the last thing they want to do is hear a lot from me and you. They want to introduce well, you. They, they want to hear a lot from me. But that's, I do that too. <laughs> I do that extra segment. We call it After Pensado's Place. Her. I host that by myself. Her. What's that? What's that? Trollic's place. <laughs> place. That's the Spanish oh, spelling no. for Trollic. <laughs> Twizzle Flanger guy, don't 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 get on Photoshop again. Go what was Canada, our Twitter Canada, Hey, Canada, Will, what, what was the Twitter Flanger. Flanger guy's name? He doesn't know. He'd have to look it up. He said it. What did you say? 
And I showed that to Jack Joseph. Jack got a big kick out of that. So you might want to design something for Jack, too, and then <laughs> give, give Herb his own logo for his own T-shirt and his own show. But you're a spinoff. You're going to be a spinoff. Herb's place. Oh, I thought I was going to be in the spinners. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I think, I think, is Jack still here? I think he got nervous and left nah, after he's, that. He's just saying, God, it's so different than the setup. You guys are like <laughs> Looney Tunes once the camera goes on. Can I introduce Jack? Yeah, please do. Man, Absolutely. Jack, my friend, my pal, my confidant. Great to have you, man. Great I'm going to introduce Jack by saying this. A few shows back, I told you guys the importance of surrounding yourself with, with a handful of people, three or four people that you trust, and that you guys grow together. You, you discover things in the audio world together. I'm not talking about you guys that are earning a living right now, although I still have that support network, and that's what I'm getting to. Uh, when I have a problem or when I have a, uh, a, an issue to discuss, I can get Jack on the phone or we see each other you know, at, at various functions involving a good buddy of ours. And, and it really helps to have someone that goes through what you go through on a daily basis that you can discuss this with because a lot of things in our lives as engineers, there's only a few people in this world that you can discuss them with. So first and foremost, let me, let me thank you for always being there for me. And, and another thing I love about Jack is we have a great friend between us named Ron Fair. And every once in a while, Ron will come in the control room and, and listen to my mix. But that's great. And, and Jack's always very supportive of what I do. But every once in a while, he'll come in and he'll play a mix by somebody else. And, 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 this, and, and because they send him a, a, a track to, to, to Larrabee to, to, to listen to and make sure it's OK and approve it. And I always get inadequate f feelings of inadequacy when I hear anybody else's mix in, in that context. And, and I'm always like, damn, that sounds better than my mix, doesn't it, Jack? That's incredible. That's the best mix I ever heard. And Jack always goes, that mix ain't crap, Dave. You're blowing them away. <laughs> and then when Ron hears that, Ron, uh, I always go, maybe I can work another week, you know? Do you ever get those kind of, well, let's don't start there. Let's start with... Back when you were a bass player, you, you, you had some problems in, in, in the control room, and you were doing a demo, and uh, I guess there was some, some, some glitch with the engineering. You walked in the control room, and at that moment, you were like, I'm on the wrong side of the glass. I want to be on this side of the glass. Is that? Well, what happened was when I went on the other side of the glass because of the issue and because my father was a television repairman, and I, so I grew up around electronics mm -hmm. and all that, and I was very comfortable with it. Uh -huh. uh, when I went on the other side of the glass, I was able to pinpoint the issue considerably quickly, considering I never had been on the other side of the glass in terms of a professional environment of that sort. Yeah. So um, I realized very quickly, like, wait a second, you know, I have a massive aptitude for this very organically without even trying to do it. Mm -hmm. And I had read an article uh, by a drummer named Jeff Picaro. Oh. And the article by Jeff Picaro spoke about the fact that you should always put yourself in a position of doing something or working on being involved in something that you're naturally very good at or you'll end up being unhappy because you'll try and try and try and never reach that benchmark of some sort of satisfaction, right, personal satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So I remembered that. And when I went on the other side of the glass and it became very simple, I was like, all right, this is Jeff's advice, mm -hmm. and who I just loved him as a... As a, as a student musician, he was the first one to the session, the last one to leave, and always brought inspiration. Mm -hmm. How'd you get from? Was an incredible get, player. Uh, what was the time frame when you when you from there to like working with Glenn Johns? Was that like several years? Yes, that was several years. That would be about eight years. Whoa. Seven eight years. And what did you do during that eight year period? Did, did I, well, I started in a small little record studio um, where a lot of Barry White and Love and Lid Orchestra records were made mm -hmm. by an engineer named Frank Kamar. And so I watched a lot of that, you know, beginning of the real, the real thing. You know, mm -hmm. we, we talk about a lot of urban acts that are, mm -hmm. everyone's afraid of and mm -hmm. stuff. These guys actually ruled, Barry White and his crew actually ruled with guns. <laughs> I remember them putting the cons guns on top of the no console, 357 Magnums. In fact, this show, we're looking for yeah. a Smith & Wesson sponsorship on well, this show. Well, that, that, that would do it. And so anyhow, um, so that's how that started. And I got to see some of the very great uh, Gene Page is a great orchestrator, yeah, some phenomenal musicians and things that was really interesting. At that point, of course, I didn't even know what a microphone cord was. I was bringing water to the control room. I was in nobody or nothing, mm. right? And I just watched. And of course, every light was twice as bright as it really was. And mm -hmm. every person was twice as big. And it was romantic beyond romantic. Right. Guys, listen to that. Let's listen. And then from there, um, I was offered a job um, 
at a place called Martin Sound, uh, where a lot of Christian records were made. Mm -hmm. And so that was the inroads to my whole contemporary Christian music era. And those two eras, along with training with uh, Bill Shea, um, wow. who just adopted me. Bill goes to um, my church. Yeah, Bill just adopted me. You know, he just, and so I started traveling with him, uh, watching him make records and watching how he interacted. And he was very fair and gracious in that he allowed me to not just see the record making process, but the interaction with the record executives and with the artists mm -hmm. and how all that worked. Mm -hmm. And so it was an incredible education for me. And mm -hmm. then that, that introduced me to his best friend, Doug Sachs, at that time, which was Mastering Lab. And so I got this go to the direct disc recordings. And so tone and sound meant a lot to me. And I watched how they arrived at some of those and how the, and they also taught me how to listen. You know, one thing that's very, very important is how to listen. And the uh, only other person skill. I've ever heard really talk about that other than the Sheffield family is Scott Litt. Mm. Scott Litt and I have spoken about that. Scott Litt has always, um, as I have with my assistants, always teach the assistants how to listen. There's a way to listen. You've got to know what you're listening to. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's not just what you're hearing, but what your body is feeling. You know? How your feet connect to the floor. How the floor is moving around you. When you're leaning on the console, how does the console feel on you? All those things are telling you something. Mm -hmm. The speakers are telling you something the way they feel. You know, so you interpolate all those elements to know what you've got. Mm -hmm. And I remember, who I'll leave nameless for political reasons, it was a, a, an act that I worked with that was making an, a record with a very, very huge, huge producer at the time, very popular in New York. And this producer had just finished some massive records and was really on top of it. And he was making them record with a tent in a control room. And he had, uh, they had MS tens, which were, of course were very common at that point. In the a tent in the control room. Everyone had to wear little lights so they could see. And they were all excited about it, and they were telling me about it. And they said, "Yeah, man, it's really incredible. Like every one or two days, we uh, blow up MS tens." Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself privately, uh, "Okay, has anyone explained to them that if the MS tens are blowing, that they're blowing for a reason? <laughs> like that's telling you something, right. right?" But they thought it was cool because they were a rock band. The record got completed, and it was then sent to uh, a gentleman to mix who, who, who they, weren't, they just couldn't make it work. Then they gave it to another guy that has three names, right? And that three name guy <laughs> had trouble making it work, and so they brought it to me. I was the third guy to come on board after the, the three name guy and the other guy. Mm -hmm. so another spent, three name guy. They had spent $2.2 .2 million at this point. Wow. So <clears throat> they brought it to me, and I, it was very interesting. I put it up on the console, and this will give you an example of what I'm talking about. I put it up, and I'm listening to it on the NS10s, and it feels odd. Like, the record feels odd. Like, I'm moving the faders around. I'm like, okay, I understand why these people must be having a difficult time. It just feels funny. And then I switched it to Tannoy's speakers. And what would happen was, when it would come to the chorus, the whole record would start to fibrillate as if you had put tremolo on the entire mix. Mm. And what I discovered was, in the process of recording, they had done a lot of processing with synthesizers and things. So they had had these incredibly low subsonic frequencies that visually you couldn't see in the meters and you couldn't hear on a pair of Venice tens. Mm. But when you got to the tannoys that had a low frequency content, it, you know, able to produce a low frequency content, mm -hmm. they, they were going crazy trying to furbolate it, right? And the stereo bus was like, I don't have to deal with those frequencies. So therefore it was not adding up. So I immediately had to go into my filtering skills and start filtering and cleaning, finding where the subsonic issues were. You know, one hertz, two hertz, three hertz type stuff. Mm. Real low stuff, five oh, hertz stuff. Yeah. And once I cleaned it up, it was like, bada boom, there was a the record, THX, mm. you know? And so the speakers were talking to me. The console, when I was aren't resting on it, I could feel something. I could feel something on the floor. Like it was trying to do something. It was, it was talking to me. Mm. So I had to use my initial skill set of, of feeling it right, which is your real creative side of you, and then I had to switch the other side of my brain to the intellectual, mm -hmm. technical, laboratory wow. part and go, mm -hmm. all right, solve. Mm -hmm. What is it? You know, the, the creative side of you is telling you there's an issue, and the technical side of you has to solve it. Mm -hmm. You've got to work hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And so we solved it, and again, you know, the record just came to, once I solved those frequencies, the filtered frequencies, boom, there Amazing. was the record. Amazing. Wow. That's, that's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. But, you know, four names are even better than three. <laughs> mm. Dave, hard drive, Pensado. But that's not, okay. we'll save that for another time. All right. You said, you said in, in one <laughs> interview that I was reading that, uh, I forget how you put it, but you, nowadays 
in the old uh, in the old days, people could actually pick studios because studios had a unique sound, and uh, instead of engineers having the unique sound, and then when when, <laughs> when engineers uh, when when the SSL came in, it kind of changed everything, and then you said, I forget exactly how you said it, but maybe you can, you can remember it. But you said that uh, that. Now, instead of making a Norman Rockwell, you could make a, a Mona Lisa, and that was the point of uh, uh, that, that, that you were trying to make in, in this particular article. Do you remember? Do you remember? Well, there's a, there's a few different perspectives with that. Um, if, if we look at it from the record company perspective, I'd tell a story one way, and if we look at it from a record making process, it's another story. So, from the record making process, uh, I'll do it as quickly as I can. Uh, initially, when I first started, there were probably something around 75 or 80 record studios in Hollywood. There were, there were millions of them, effectively. And the technical people, the technical staff of those given record studios competed with each other. Not only did you have the engineers competing, but you had the technical staffs competing. So they would take a Tektronix LA2, for instance, and they would go inside and look at it and figure out how they could modify and what they could change to make theirs faster, better, and, you know, and in a sense put slicks on it and carburetors. And, you know, it was a race, you know. And you had guys that had that... There were musicians who had that real great aesthetic about them, that, that X factor. They could take the technical equipment, and when they were through with it, it just had something that it didn't have before. We'll call it fairy dust, for lack of a better description, or X factor. Mm -hmm. And so the studios were competing with each other, and they were all very unique. They had different consoles. Some were homemade. Some were so modified that effectively they were homemade, even though they were a major manufacturer. And so the skill set got to be not only were you drawn in by those particular record studios, now, uh, uh, the other skill set that went hand in hand with that is as you made the record, as you recorded the record, you had to figure out which place you could mix it that would be the right counterpart to the way the record was recorded. And sometimes you might even revisit a few places. I remember working on a Belly album with Glenn Johns. Glenn Johns was the producer. And we were in NASA, where we recorded it. And he said, I want you to take the tape and go back to L.A. and pick a studio for us to mix it in. And he said, okay. Because what do you think? I said, well, I think of four places. One was Ocean Way Studio Two. One was Sunset Sound, and um, other one was Schnee Studio. And uh, I think the other one might have been a place. I don't. We call Studio Fifty Five was the other one. Oh wow! Yeah. And Bill and I'll never forget Glenn saying to me, "It's going to be without a doubt, it, without a doubt, it'll be Sunset Sound Studio Three. I go, I don't know, man. That's console over at Ocean Way and Studio Two. That all Class A console could be really great. And he goes, Nope, not going to work. We got a big argument about it. Yeah. I went back, took the tape, went to the three places, showed up as to Sound Factory as the last one, Sunset Sound actually, as the last one, put the faders up, and it was just like, he's right. It was like, bada boom. And he really had it, because that's how he grew up. Mm -hmm. But that talent no longer is necessarily 100% valid. But at the same time, I should say that a lot of the talents that we had in the analog domain still apply in the digital domain. They just have changed. I, I agree with that. You know, the rules are still the rules. Nature is nature. Right. It just has a different look and a different skew. Mm -hmm. And so the fun part for me, as the digital revolution has come upon us, is actually altering some of those basic skill sets. Mm -hmm. um, it's fun because mm -hmm. it's something new. In terms of the record company, all I said about that was when you sign a major record company contract, mm -hmm. they ask you to make not Mona Lisa's. They ask you to make Norman Rockwell's mm -hmm. because you have to appeal to the mass. Absolutely. It's about pop culture. So being precious, mm -mm. go go play in an orchestra, drive a Volkswagen, right. and make twelve thousand right. dollars a year. That's right. That's right. Just so you guys, like I said, if you've been living under a rock, uh, I'm, I'm going to read you just some of my favorite Jack Joseph Puig records. Um, Jack did all the Crows, Cheryl Black, and Counting. I like the way you said that. So I stole that from you. <laughs> That's funny. That was no, I stole that from him. I thought that was great. Uh, no doubt, um, uh, Green Day, Weezer, little group out of England called the Rolling Stones. Uh, did that album, the 2002 album? The names. For, uh, I've done two of their albums, and I've done a couple of Mick Jagger solo records as well. Uh, and then, and then uh, Fergie. Uh, Black Eyed Peas. We're going to talk about one of the Fergie songs in a minute. Uh, U2, mm -hmm. Mary J. Blige. Little names. I mean, you know, small stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, this is my list, but if I had written the whole list, it'd be like over to where Drew is. Uh, I mean, just, just 
not, not only has Jack made great records, he's made important records. And if you've been doing this a minute, you understand what I'm talking about that. Jack, one of the things that, that I think has kind of led me to, to like your records is you think of our profession as not just manipulating frequencies and volume and, and this sort of thing, but, but you, 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 you have a knack for understanding the importance of emotion in a record, of feeling, of, of how, how, how different things relate to what you feel about that record when you hear it. And, and describe, if you can, uh, I, I want to get into, uh, you, into your use of compression, because you use compression differently than anybody I've ever noticed. But let's start in the mid-range. Give me your philosophy about the mid-range. You said that you, you took a CD and you walked down the, the aisle with all the blaster boxes that fries and put it in every one, and every one sounded different, but the mid-range was the one well, consistent when, thing that you... Well, when I started, if we go back to what I said earlier about the Sheffield Labs, Mastering Lab, Bill Schnee, those, those people who are interested in making records from, as they would say, DC the light, you know, full frequency spectrum beyond your imagination, that was a, a big thrust of, of how I started. So, you know, you're talking about people who would take their own tape machine, multi-track tape machines to recording studios that they had hot rotted. Mm. You know, their own microphones they had hot rotted, their own mic preamps they had hot rotted, their own compressors they had hot rotted that they would bring in the day way before anyone even thought about having their own personal arsenal of equipment mm. as a record engineer, right? So that's how I started with that mentality. So I was always trying to make things as beautiful as I could and open as I could and as extended as I could from a frequency perspective. And one day I realized that all this talk about low end and top end and all that's fantastic and I get it and I understand it, but like not everyone has that. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you listen to what comes out of a car, you know, maybe you have subwoofers in that, maybe you have super tweeters in that particular high end car, mm -hmm. but you might be in a Volkswagen that doesn't have that and you might be pushing a shopping cart that's having something come out of a ceiling mm -hmm. that certainly doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. And the list goes on. I need to make any more analogies. So I quickly realized, really, you know, 600 cycles to 2.5, 3K, 4K, that's really what matters. Mm -hmm. And not only does it matter from the standpoint that it's common to all those systems, I also adopt the philosophy that that's where the soul of the instrument lives. Mm -hmm. That's where the real attitude lives. You know, as I speak to you on the, right now on this system, you're hearing the sound of my voice, and, and to my own ear, it's kind of mid rangey you know, but that's the character of my voice. And if I change my voice like this, it has a whole nother character. Mm -hmm. And if I go like this, it's almost void of character, you know, because all these highs and lows, but there's no real character. And this has got character. This has got attitude. So the mid-range has, has all that. It has apparent volume. It's the soul of the instruments where it lies, where the cry of the instrument is, mm -hmm. you know, where the tear of the instrument is you know, or the smile of the instrument is it's in that mid-range. So that is, to me, the most important band, and it's define, always... Define mid-range for me. Like, you would say that's from what to what? I, I would say, for me, mid-range uh, lies from around 600. I mean, you, some, you could argue to me five, but I, I think 600 is, you know, 500 is almost volume in some ways. So it's, it's so wide. 600 uh, to 3.5, 3.7, somewhere in there. Oh, that high? Yeah, it, to me is mid-range. Okay. That's 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 pretty fascinating. I I, uh, uh, I guess around 15 years ago or 10 years ago, whenever that Black Street album came out that had the fix on it, the first Teddy Riley uh, Black Street record, that record just sounded louder than everything I had done. And when I started really looking at the meters, it wasn't louder. It's just he had the mid-range just masterfully handled in that record, and then. And then as I got to know you later on, I realized you were doing some similar things. You, you, and I think that's why you and I are drawn to NS10s because the NS10s are one of the few speakers that allow you to really work consistently in that 600 to 2K range. You, 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 they got a little bump there, so, so they, I guess that's a good thing because that helps you hear it. It's a bad thing because if you're listening for it as an audiophile, it might drive you nuts, but if you're listening like you said, you have to learn how to listen and what to listen for. 
and the NS10s are designed more for, I'm not making this an NS10 commercial, but I want to read you something that, that really struck me. You said, um, you said, um, compression is definitely the most musical tool we have. I don't care for compression as a volume control. Using compression to alter feel and to affect performances has been done for a long time. And then you gave the, the, the example of the 160 and then on, on, uh, on the Fergie song, you, you talked about how you altered the attack of the acoustic guitar to, to, to alter the feel. And several songs, you, you, I can hear you, you, you stretch some notes out, some with the attack emphasized, like with the trans X on some, some songs you right. use. Can, that, well, that, I think that's worthy of spending a few minutes on well, because uh, if, if that's all we learn from you today, me included, I'm going to go home a happy guy and have I'm something to work on today. I'm going to backwards, in a sense, and go forward backwards. Let's, let's move to, to now, right? Now, with Pro Tools, we'll talk about that particular DAW, you know, platform, um, you would have the ability to actually scoot a track in, in a different place. You can move something by X amount of milliseconds or any, any particular musical value, you know, et cetera, right? Now, if you go back to how it was, like, for instance, um, working with a lot of bands on analog tape, right? You didn't have that ability. There was no alter, alternate playlist, yeah. right? So that meant that you had a set of tracks and musicians that played a certain way, and you had to assimilate where they f those musicians fit together in the bar line. So maybe the guitar player plays on top of the bar line, and maybe the bass player still happens to just like lay back a lot. Kind so like that Stones record you were right. talking about. So if you push the bass up. It's for Herb. The record's going to feel one way, and if you push the guitar, the record's going to feel another way. It's obvious, right? So <clears throat> when it came to Fergie, I remember that it was a, initially, and actually is a demo. Most of it is a demo that was fixed up. Yeah, it was, her it was actually her writing demo. And when I heard the acoustic guitar, it was so, like, beautiful. And the feeling of the song... In my mind, uh, maybe because I'm Spanish, I thought of it sort of like a flamingo, sexy thing. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to see what I, make it feel like the fingernails. You know, when you when when mm -hmm. you play flamingo, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's all that that mm -hmm. kind of a feel. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't played that way. It's played by an American. You know, that's just how they were thinking. But that's the feeling I wanted a little bit. I wanted the sexy element of it. You so wanted, you wanted the vision of that to come yes, through the speakers. Exactly. So I pulled up the Transex which has, you know, the multiple abilities to have the attack altered and release altered over selected frequencies. Mm -hmm. And I went after it with that, and I changed the release and attack times and the frequencies I chose so that the guitar part, which could feel stagnant, didn't any longer. It also wheezed and it moved and it, went, and it moved around. There was a whole alternate rhythm now mm -hmm. within his rhythm mm -hmm. that existed. Mm -hmm. and, and that's always been what compression has been to me. I mean, the truth of the matter is it really started with the Beatles, by the mere fact that they were recording on you know, a small tape machine, four tracks, and they were having to bounce things around, each time it was going through that Fairchild, and that Fairchild was compressing, it was adding its own rhythm. And as the, each instrument went on, it told the compressor, oh, I'm the loudest, you go with my feel, how hard I hit the downbeat, or don't hit the downbeat, right? Mm -hmm. exactly. And then all you other guys who hit the downbeat soft, sorry, now you're hitting it hard because I'm hitting it hard and I'm the loudest thing, right? So mm -hmm. now that had a feel, mm -hmm. right? So, once I realized that very early on, I was like, wow, you can really like alter the feel and time with this. Mm. So then you start choosing compressors, different compressors that do that. The audio tracks by Waves might be one of my favorites for that. If you just go to classic, the classic uh, setting, which is in their particular preset setting, operating preset system, uh, and turn off the, the uh, gate function, it's incredible what you can do with that thing. You can, it, the feel of that moving around the attack release you can make something that just feels so like, ugh, just sitting there. Like, what were they thinking? You picture some guy, that white guy, sitting there like, <laughs> with like a white bread sandwich in front of him. So boring, you want to shoot yourself in the head, you know. And by the time you get done with this thing, it's like, this shit's like moving. You know, it's like bouncing. It's got a whole little rhythm to it that I never had before. And it's that compressor just moving the time and the feel. Because it's all about time constant, you know. So it's almost impossible in a context like this to totally explain it without... A, a demo. Oh, I understand. You know, and but then just, walking through what the different ones do because I mean, they're all different. I mentioned several records that you've already done that on, so you can just do like me. You can just go study those records. But if it's possible to describe it, you just told me it wasn't, so I don't know why I want to ask you this. But um, 
I've, I, my whole career, I've struggled with understanding compression, and you've just you've just taken me like a huge step closer to understanding compression. Brower, uh, Michael got me really close. Swedeen got me closer. Uh, the are you actually when you apply a compressor, um, are, are you're you're manipulating basically the attack time and the release time to create a rhythmic element to the track. So you're not listening to the effect of the compression necessary for sonic things. You're listening for feel, feel and feel. but feel as it as it relates to groove, as it relates to, to timing issues, right? Hundred percent. So so if a track is is early a little bit, I can understand it. If it's late, you, you can still apply the same concept compression-wise. If a track like like if a track's running is a little late, you can make it feel. Well, remember that what, what the, the way the human brain perceives early or late is by the length of the note. The Haas effect. Right. Uh -huh. So, if you have a, a. Oh, so you're you're using the 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 release more than the attack on the late stuff. On the early stuff, you're using the attack more than the release. Exactly and the brain perceives it differently. Mm -hmm. And remember, we're only talking about one isolated instrument. Now, if you apply that across all the instruments, mm -hmm. what we'll call time zero is no longer really time zero, mm -hmm. because the guys that were early that you're speaking of, maybe you've made them a little bit later, and the guys the other way, you've made them the other way, and now you've moved them together in a place where they're all talking to each other and feeling a certain tell, way. Tell, tell Does that make is, sense? Uh, I, well, I'm going to ask you a question. It's a massive, and, you know, I'm going to ask you a algebraic. question. If my question makes sense, then it makes sense to me. So, so what you're saying is like, say, one of my pet peeves with strings is they always seem to be late because they swell into the note. They don't, dun, they're, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. So if, if you, with compression, if you emphasize something in the track, like let's say an acoustic guitar is in the track, you put transects on it, you emphasize the attack time as a certain spot, then that kind of masks, masks and covers the attack of the string, and now you work with a release time other end of the string to put that in time to where they stop. And the cumulative effect of, of the acoustic guitar hitting on the beat where you want it, the string being late, but you don't perceive that, but the string's ending on time, you do perceive that. Is that... 100%. Because but you do, it, because that, to, the ear, you do the ear, that to 20 tracks. Yeah, because the ear hears the front end of that acoustic guitar, so that tells it where mm -hmm. that particular musical value is. Right? Uh -huh. Within however you want to break it down, 64th, 32nd, 16th, 8th, quarter note, however you want to break it down, it tells you where that is. Drew, are you, are, 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 is this making sense to you? Yeah. Seriously? I mean, <coughs> should I ask more questions about that? Or? Yeah, for sure. That's I mean, it's right. kind of crazy. This is sort of almost mathematics that we're talking about. But, and, uh -huh. and a lot of it, I don't even do it. I don't do it. Well, you do it by feel. It's yeah, like I, you're making me think, like, what exactly do I do? But a lot of it is just I just do it instinctively. And you're using, you're using like, three and four ratios, ratios of three and four? Or are you using more limiting ratios, like 20 or uh, subtle? It, it depends what it is. If it's... Um, what, what are you listening for when you increase the ratio, for example? Uh, I'm actually increasing the effect of what that thing is doing. That makes sense, right? of course. So the higher yeah. you go up, the more aggressive that effect is becoming because of the ratio. Gotcha. That's brilliant. Oh, listen, it's just, this is just fascinating to sit and listen to. Why don't we build in, um, bring in our chat jockey, Drew, in the corner office, and uh, let's remind our audience that in our corner office this time around, we got Alex from Vintage King in there as well, too, to answer questions, so we can get some of the questions from our audience and continue this dialogue. No, you can ask whatever you want. We just have to get the corner office. Okay. So after Dave asked this question, <laughs> so uh, it's not like you couldn't ask it during corner office, but we want to, because we got Alex from Vintage King in there. So oh, okay, great. So ask your question, then we'll go to the corner office. Uh, 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 this, this puzzles me, too. You said you can make the notes longer, shorter, brighter, or darker. What, how do you, how, the compression making a note brighter? Because if it has... Oh, the attack. The attack. It gives the, oh, oh you I hear gotcha. The tick, the tick at the front of the note. I think I got that, it, That quick of a transient makes it yeah. think, oh, it's bright. But if it's, you know, if you're taking off the front, and it's going, oh, oh, you, it sounds you dark. You hear that, Drew? You know, because that's how the ear perceives it. It's all, it's all a mental game. I'm surprised you, because I was explaining that to you in the car. I know, but I didn't get I, it. He explained it so much better than you did. Yeah, exactly. So, Drew, I mean, wants you... I mean, it's just my philosophy. Drew, why don't you tee us up on yeah, some we questions? Yeah, uh, we got a lot of questions for you, Jack. And I still got more Dave. questions. Yeah, I'm sure. I count for something. Um, first one uh, from Al Alien Implant. 
Would you mind sharing what equipment specifically yielded your, or inspired the fader FX, such as sub attitude, edge, warm presence, tone, and magic? My sincerest thanks to you and Waves for this plugins. That's a whole show. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's fairly deep. That's um, fairly what deep. each fader is. Yeah. Uh, I had no problem doing it. It's a, if you want to spend the time, it's not not uh, well, 30 we're seconds. Well, we're going to cover some of that in batter's box, aren't we? That's a, whatever you want. It's okay. just uh, it's not quick Two answer, but I'll do whatever you want. Over. I'm here to make people happy. <laughs> okay, from uh, Adam Claremont. Uh, you mentioned in an interview you sometimes EQ a certain way to get a compressor to react a certain way, then EQ again afterwards. Can you elaborate on that practice? Sure. Um, you know, if uh, let's let's good, good good example would be if you had a hi hat and you were sending into the hi hat of, into the compressor a very bright frequency, right, accentuated. Now the compressor has more to look at in terms of the front of the note. Mm -hmm. They can really see the front of the note. If, if, the, if it's dark, right, and it's got a lot of lower frequency, let's say, then it's going to act, the compressor is going to act differently because all these compressors, right, are frequency oriented, mm -hmm. right? So how they detect the audio and then tell the rest of the unit what to do mm -hmm. has a lot to do with frequencies. If you have a lot of low yeah. frequencies, they move one way because, again, Hence how because they perceive, works. yeah, because they perceive a long note as opposed to a short note. It has a brain too, mm -hmm. right? The way the photocell works, the way it thinks. Mm -hmm. So uh, you change that for the feel, and then you could change on the other end less or more of what you did so that what you end up in the end is something that's satisfactory from a frequency perspective, but you get the feel that you wanted. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. This is uh, so another cool. one from uh, Ruben Keeney. How do you generally keep your volume levels when mixing low, high, or a mixture of high and low, or set level of all the time? And also, do you use headphones much when you mix, and why, if you do? If you're talking about, obviously, it must be modern and lovely, speaking of. Um, it depends what I'm, I'm wanting to do. If I'm listening really, really aggressively to time, pitch, and balance, I listen extremely low. Um, I listen low in terms of balancing and actually all three of those elements because I want the sound of the room not in the equation. And the reflection of the console, all those things, I don't want them in the equation. So the lower the volume goes, the less that's in the equation. You also said that, um, that when you listen low it, 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 and, and it sounds banging and loud low, you know you're, you're close to done. Yeah, Andy Wallace, who I think most of us probably respect, oh, oh, um, listens that it's so low that if a mouse was in the room it would be too much. A mouse walking on the floor would be too loud. Um, I've spent time with him in, in sessions and watched him work, and that's how he works. And I'm a huge proponent of his work. I think he's nothing less than fabulous. Um, so he listens very, very low. Also, there's, there's the fatigue level, you know, there, and there's the fake. When you listen real loud, there's the fake element of what the amplifiers are adding, the distortion the speakers are adding, all those things. So you think, like, this is bang, and it's really loud. So it's really the amplifier's folding. And it's compressing the itself, and distorting. It's all distorting, and then you get it out, and you're like, "Oh, mm. well, well, what happened?" So that's another reason to not listen that way. Now, sometimes you you gotta listen loud to get excited. You know, be sometimes I'll pull, I'll pull up something, and maybe it doesn't totally push my buttons, and I'll just crank it and work for a while like that just to get myself excited about mm -hmm. what it is, mm -hmm. just to get myself in the mood and then excited. And then once I down. once I, I kind of got it, it's like, okay, put that in. So I have a, I have a Polaroid of it mm -hmm. of where I was. Mm -hmm. Now I turn down. Mm -hmm. Meat and potatoes, what do I got? Yeah. Right? Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. For me, when I was first learning how to engineer, I thought I needed the volume to be able to hear the nuances of what I was trying to do. As my ear got more sophisticated, I didn't need the volume. I was relying more on my experience at that point. But the first five or six years I, I was engineering, I probably killed a lot of, a lot of brain cells and hearing cells. Were you that way too when you first started? Yeah. You think it's a thing to do. You think it's cool. Yeah. Well, I couldn't hear it unless I turned yeah. it loud. Then as I got used to those subtle details from the volume, my volume started going down and down and down and down and down and down. Mm. Um, on the, on the, oh, I'm sorry. You want to keep going? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, another question from Richard Diaz de Leon. Can you describe your process when producing and mixing a project? Do you mix as you go? That is, how much do you treat the individual tracks uh, during tracking? If I'm producing the record, I am always mixing to the end. I write from day one. It's like, I don't believe in, oh, when we get to the, mat to the mixing, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure the bass drum sounds right, and then when we get to the mastering, we'll fix it again. It's like, uh-uh. 
A record should sound great from the very beginning and every step of the way because you're, as a record producer, you're evaluating their arrangement. You're evaluating the performances. You're evaluating what you need to do to make that record and that song you know, come to its full fruition. So if you're not hearing it right, then how can you evaluate what it is? Man, we should do a, a, a whole right? show with you about the psychological part of producing because that's, that's as, as important as the physical yeah, part. It's, when you, you got know, bands. A record engineer and a record producer are two separate two things. Separate things. Yeah. Um, and some, there are a few who have been able to do, who, who really earn the word, you know, producer engineer, but there's not very many. You know, along that line, let me ask you, because you're, you have the distinction, there's not very many folks who, beyond the breadth of music you've dealt with, which, you know, starting with contemporary Christian and moving forward and all the different influences you've had and the breadth of records you've had, but also as an engineer and a mix engineer who's just, you know, world class and a producer, and you've been a record executive. Have all those things informed you along the way? Has it changed your perspective, how you look at things? It's, oh, 100%. It, it, it's got to be a look that very few people have. 100%. I feel that um, what I'm most enthusiastic about is I feel like in working in a record company and having that education, mm -hmm. right, um, and having it from that perspective, mm -hmm. seeing why they make the decisions that they make, why things happen the way they make them, and no matter what anyone tells you, until you've had that experience, you, you cannot understand it. I've, I've had it. And as, as a right. record maker, I didn't understand a lot of the decisions that were made. Yeah. It didn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. Once you sit in that conference room of 42 people, and you hear the different people speak, and you see how production, the production element of the company speaks, and how manufacturing speaks, and how A&R speaks, and marketing. how promotion speaks, mm -hmm. and how marketing thinks, and how the head of the company thinks, and what his two right and left hands think, you're like, international. oh, okay, yeah. I get it now. It's like yeah. there's a whole another playing field. So yeah. what I'm enthusiastic about is I'm noticing as a record maker now that I have that education. Mm -hmm. I see it from their standpoint. Mm -hmm. So so in terms of an A&R person, there could be never, there can't be a better right hand mm -hmm. as a guy any guy who's ever worked in a record company becomes the best thing to a right to mm -hmm. an AR person because mm -hmm. you know their job. Absolutely. You know where they're trying to go Absolutely. and you go, I'm going to help you get you there. understand the challenges. And I understand the challenges are important. I know it's going to feel like when you've got to take it into that conference room. I know the emotions you're going to go through. I have gone through those emotions. I get it. Mm -hmm. We're going to get there. Mm -hmm. And in this day and age where, where a, a large part of the records are being made, what I call LE operators mm -hmm. or, or, or more importantly, laptop artists, I call right. them. Right. Right. That's right. Now is the time that, as an engineer, producer, and a mixer, right, or any combination thereof, or separately, having the, the, those kinds of sensibilities are so important because now you're dealing with these laptop artists that effectively is one brain mm. in, a, in an, any kind of makeshift situation, right? And you now have to A and R with them, mm -hmm. in a sense. You got to sit them, talk to them about the songs, see what they're going through, help them going through it, what, what direction you're trying to go. You know, and figure out how much to push him, not how, not, how much not to get involved because you've got the unique thing. That whole clutch and massive gear shifting that needs to transpire is something I'm very enjoying. I've already had three experiences that way with laptop artists who are these guys that, you know, effectively make a record on a laptop. Yep. And they can maybe on a good day get it up to a strong seven. Maybe they got lucky in a hit an eight. Mm. Lucky. Mm. But they're like, I don't know how to do a nine mm -hmm. or, or a, a ten. ten. And more importantly, I don't know the fairy dust thing. Mm -hmm. Right? So they bring it to you and they're like, okay, I think it's a seven. Everyone's freaking out. They think it's great. But I know it can be better. I want to put my ego aside. Help. And you take that. Those are my favorite kind of projects. Those are the best ones. You take the laptop artist, wow. you know, and you put your production brain on it. You put your engineering brain on it. Your mixing brain on it. And your record making brain. Right? And you can come out with some pretty amazing stuff. And that's the future. Yeah, no question. That'll come Jack, to the present. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 you, you said one time that, that you like, in fact, I'm just going to read it again because I like the way you said it. Uh, you recommend for a better mixing environment to create systems. And I've, I've done that somewhat, but I've tried to not do it too much. And I think you hit the perfect balance, and I understand why now. You said, for me, my drums always start at at track 23 and will go all the way to 46. My vocals come down on 32. My bass comes down on 25 and 26. Guitars, 30, 31. Uh, backing vocals, 17 and 18. And, and, and I'm not going to read your quote because I, you I, I'd like to hear you say it. But, but you said the important, I used to think that maybe I was cheating, but you said the importance is that it removes the technical element and all you can, uh, and, and that's a different 
side of our brain and it and it and it leaves you with only the creative to think about if if you're if you're wanting if you're thinking bass you don't go let's see where's that damn bass you know there's my bass fitter and so you're thinking always creatively and you and you're removing the technical part from the process which is not what we're paid for we're paid for the creative part not the technical part can you amplify that a little bit well, sure. cuz I thought that was great I'll, I'll I'll talk to to some it's it's like you get in a car for the first time that you purchase, you know, and, and you're not sh you don't remember exactly where the key is, and you know the stick shift is kind of here. You know, there's a, you got to get used to it. And after... He drives a little more expensive cars than us. You know, stick shift, you know what he's yeah. talking about, right? Yeah, because our cars are like the Flintstone cars. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we got here this Well, way. I'm just saying that you, it takes you a bit of time, and then you, you actually start to get used to it. Mm -hmm. And you, you no longer start thinking about any of those things. So... If you're having a serious thought in your mind that day about something and you approach your car, you're not thinking about putting the key in the car. You're not thinking about, mm -hmm. you, you, you're doing all that and you're still in your brain going through all these thoughts and processing what you're thinking about, right? Yeah. You grab your seatbelt, you're still thinking. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing when you're making, when you're mixing like that. As long as you have to start thinking about where's the base, wrong space. Just, right. you're just, you're out of it. Yeah. Where if I have them always set up the same way, right? I, can, I just don't even think about it. I just go there, I grab it. It's like, boom, boom. It's like, that's where middle C is. <laughs> that's where C1 is. You know, it's like playing an instrument. Yep. I don't even think about it. Exactly. It's there for you. Right. Yeah. And I think it should be that way. No question. I have to say that Glenn Johns taught me that. Hmm. I wish wow. I could take credit. Tell us another Glenn, Glenn Johns story when you were first starting out and you had spent so much time miking up a guitar. I love this story. I, I, uh, it was a John Hyde album, and I worked really, really hard. I wanted to impress him. You know, this is, a, this is effectively Yoda, first one in the lineage. You know, Led Zeppelin, the list goes on. I mean, it's tremendous what his, his body of work was. And so I wanted to really impress him. So I spent a lot of time, and I used the technique that a lot of people use with headphones and taking a microphone and moving around the speaker and listening to the different frequencies and, and choosing what you perceive as a sweet spot as well as what you think the microphone's going to hear as far as the full frequency spectrum, right? And I went back to the control room, the whole band was there, and the John Hyatt was playing. And I looked at him, and he, and he looked at me, and he goes, you done? I said, yeah, I'm done. He goes, what do you think? And he goes, I think it sounds, Glenn John says, I think it sounds amazing. Mm. I was like, yeah, I kind of did it. Mm. You know, I was kind of proud, right? He goes, okay, so you done? I said, well, yeah, you just said it sounds amazing. He goes, okay, well, let me really teach you something, right? So the whole, band's whole band walks out, out there, because he was very dramatic, and we're all standing around the amp, and I'm like, what is he going to teach me, mm. right? I'm really excited to see what I'm going to learn. And he looks at me straight in the fight face, takes his foot, and knocks the microphone down. Oh, Jesus. And my first thought is like, I'm going to kill him. You are an absolute yeah. jerk. Asshole. Like, a, a hole. Like, right. huh? Right? And then he looked at me and said, what I want you to learn about rock and roll is that nothing is precious. Mm. Wow. It's not about, it's not laboratory. Mm -hmm. I want you to grab the microphone right now I want you to look at it, and I want you to just put it there with your instinct. Effectively use the force. Hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I did it. Mm. And we went in the control room, and I listened, and it actually sounded amazing. Mm. I don't know if it was better or worse. There was no A-B, but, you know, it was, it was definitely way acceptable, mm. right? And he goes, see? And I went, yeah. He goes, oh, wait, see? Check it out. See? I went, yeah, cool. He goes, I'm going to teach you. The rock and roll is not precious. You've got to use your instinct, right? So we went on and on and on. And, taught me how to get acoustic guitar sounds like what he'd done on Desperado and Eagles and all that. Mm -hmm. It was a whole technique he uses. It was great. He showed me the Led Zeppelin three miking, like actually the real way to do it and everything. It was really educational. I learned so much with him. I changed my life. Wow. Then I went to a guitar show with my, one of my best friends, a guy named Mark Sampson, who invented matchless guitar amps, etc. And we were on the dinner table with the head of Gibson, the head of Fender, and head of another manufacturer, and then a guitar center, and Sam Ash, and they were all talking about stuff. It was boring to me. 30 days versus 60 day delivery. And it's like, oh. you know, I, I, not my conversation I wanted to have. And across from me was a guy named uh, Harvey, who has a company called Rainbow Guitars. And Harvey looks and goes, You're kind of bored, aren't you? I said, Yeah. He goes, Let's just talk for a minute. So we're talking, and him and I. And he goes, Yeah, I got to tell you something that happened to me. It's amazing. I go, What's that? He goes, I got to go to a Glenn John session. He's recording Emma Lou Harris in town. And really, he goes, it was amazing. I learned so much. I go, really? You want to tell me about it? He goes, I'll tell you, but you can't tell anyone this one technique I saw, because it was incredible. I go, well, tell me about it. He goes, well, I got there, and they were doing guitars. 
And the second said, you got to see what he's doing. He's out. And I look out there through the glass, and he was on his knees with headphones moving the microphone <laughs> on the speaker. How funny. Right? How funny. I went, what? <laughs> so the next day, I called Glenn. I tracked him down. He was in Nashville. And oh I said, oi. And I played back the whole story to him, right? <laughs> and he said to me, I never said I didn't learn anything from you. Uh, that's fabulous. And man. that was actually a full circle lesson that, wow. you know, both perspectives are right. That's right. That's right. That's Neither fantastic. one's wrong or right. That's fantastic. Art is subjective. It's objective. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Let me ask you this. Um, am I taking too much time for no, the chat? No, no, no. Ask this question, then we'll, uh, then we'll warm up your arm for batter's box. Okay. Um, my pet peeve is uh, I, I started out in, in a rock background. And my pet peeve now is, is these records that are pop records with loud guitars being passed off as rock records. Like when I listen to your records, uh, when, when you're doing rock records, they sound like rock records. Like Zeppelin could take a mandolin and, and a vocal and make it a heavy metal record. It's not where you place the guitars that makes a rock record. And it seems like there's a group of producers out there today that pretend like they're making rock records, but they're just making pop records with loud guitars, louder guitars. In fact, the guitars aren't even that loud. Does that drive you nuts also? Like, like I hear Wolf Mother, I hear uh, Queens of the Stone Age, and those are rock records to me, you know? We had Joe Barisi on the other day, and Joe makes rock records, but there's a group of people pretending like they're making rock records, and they're not really rock records. It's a large group of those people grew up with synthesizers. So they're effectively taking a, a buzz, you know, a sawtooth wave, I think, I think, and they think. I think Zeppelin, if they were, if they had a synthesizer, they could make a rock record with a synthesizer. There's something about rock that's. What I'm saying is, the, where I was going with that is the yeah. mentality behind, behind how they change from moving from that platform to the other platform. So, because if you talk about a mandolin, right? It's how you play the mandolin, going back to the earlier part of the conversation, the mid-range, the cry, the tear in the mandolin, the attitude. You know, all of that is effectively what makes it sound that way. And Andy, too, we're talking about Andy Wallace. Man, Andy makes rock records, you know? Absolutely. What, what he has in common, what's interesting about Andy Wallace, what's interesting about Bob Claremountain, what's interesting about Chad Blake, what's interesting about Jack Joseph Wig, and there's one more I'm leaving out are all ex-bass players, mm. A, mm. and B, all come from R&B mentality. Mm. So if you think about those records. So there's going to me, I'll learn to yes. play bass. And, okay, so now there's you, <laughs> there's you, and, and, and think about what you do, right? Mm -hmm. Now think about it for, about, for a minute, Andy Walls, let's talk about you and Andy Walls, mm -hmm. in terms of the low frequency content. Mm -hmm. Well, Andy the started way, out doing dance records. The way it quotes bumps, as they say, mm -hmm. is that's R&B mentality. Yeah. You know, yeah. not an urban mentality. It's an yeah. urban the yeah, uh, mentality. You know, it's weird. My my love for Low End came off of a Pat Travers record, not an R&B record. I discovered Low End in my, when I was first engineering, from a Pat Travers record. Well, why should we? I, I didn't say that right. What I really should have said is, not, I don't mean necessarily Low End. I mean the relationship between the bass drum and the bass guitar, mm -hmm. and the backbeat and the vocal. Mm -hmm. let, let me ask that, you that primal relationship. Mm -hmm. let, let me ask you this. I've always looked at the, at, at, at the low end is providing the power, the mid-range providing the credibility, and the top end providing the, the finesse and the intimacy. And, and the trendiness of a record can be heard in the, in the high end, like, 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 if you, like if you have a real dark record, like, a, like certain records, it's not dark because it needs to be. It's dark because that's kind of the trend at that moment. When CDs came in, the trend became a little brighter records, blah, 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 blah. But do you see, do you divide the frequency spectrum up in, in terms of feel, getting your credibility from the, from the lower frequencies and getting, the, uh, I mean, the power from the lower, but, but the credibility is in that 6 to 3K range. Don't, is that the way you, you, you view it well, also? Well, you call it credibility, and I was calling it soul. I think it's one and the same. Yeah, but say the word for me, genre. Genre. genre the the, the mid-range can determine what the, the genre is. But, well, remember, it's the one thing you hear in the grocery store or on the earbuds, right? Or on the big kicking system in the car. So, 100%. Nope, not that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. So, let's... Uh, <laughs> nope, uh, not that. Let's it go says to right our here. Go to Drew at at, at one fifty nine. Yeah, except Drew is spelled H E R B. Oh. Um, <laughs> Doctor Drew, Doctor Drew, not Drew. Time for batter's box. You got your arm warmed up. <coughs> our, our batter's box. This is the first week that it's. Uh, 
brought to you by our friends at Vintage King, which is very cool. Look at look at that graphic going by. Oh man, Vintage King. We love it. Thank you. Welcome. So Thank tee you, it up. Guys. We have okay. a fantastic uh, uh what I wanted to do with Jack Joseph on this week's batter's box is a little different. Um uh, I wanted to learn some more about uh, more about compression. So what what I, I I'm I'm gonna surprise Jack and ask him is to pick a compressor for these particular sounds that he uses to manipulate timing and feel. Cool that, Herb? Yeah, absolutely. Can I start now? Rock and roll, bro. Damn, Drew. Okay, acoustic guitars. So that would be the Transex, which we covered earlier. Good. Snare. Um, snare. 165 DBX. Does it have to be just one? No. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's, there's different ones that do different things. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, believe it or not, a dynamite. The old dynamite yeah. can be cracking on the front end like nothing else. Mm. Wow. Um, uh, so I really like those. I like these old RCA B35. Uh, is a great sounding thing on the snare drum. Love the SSL. Always have. Yeah, me too. Uh, once in a while, 1176 and, of course, a DBX 165 is pretty tough to beat. Yeah, I like the, the description you had of that. Uh, piano, acoustic. Probably the, the, for the most part, uh, f usually a Fairchild or 1176. Strings, like an orchestra strings. Uh, Fairchild. Fairchild? Yep. Uh, bass guitar. That's a tough one. That alters a lot. Um, do not like LA3. Do not like LA2 on bass guitar. Uh, like 1176, like yeah. 2254E, uh, once in a while will work really, really well. Mm -hmm. And Innovonics, 201. Oh, the Innovonics, I forgot about those. These can sound good on, on, on that. Of course, we're also talking about hardware pieces. There are uh, compatible pieces in the digital domain that are equally as good and sometimes better. I agree, I agree. Um, Electric guitar, like like say a John, like what you did on John Mayer's record, or like on a U2 record, that those cleaner electric guitars. What, what's your go-to on that? Neve compressors, three three two six four. Okay, uh, is a thirty three six zero nine a sub, a good substitute? Similar, but not the same thing. Not the same thing. Um, the stereo bus. Stereo bus. I've used everything you can imagine, from Joe Meek to SSL to Neve. I can I, I, every compressor you could ever imagine. I have tried on the stereo bus. Without a doubt, the SSL, for the most part, will always work. Um, and I go probably between SSL and Neve, mainly. It also depends on what I'm working on. You know, if I'm working on yeah, a, an yeah. SSL console, I may want the opposite and vice versa. Uh, I've tried the Focus I read a few times. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, usually it's one of those two. Does Chris use the Focus right Yeah, they're red range people. And, I, and I've <laughs> tried it, but eh. Um, I'm going to have to do a show on stereo bus compression again because I get confused with that so much. You've tried to help me in the past. I understand that Chris has tried to help me. I've asked everybody I know. I'm, I'm getting better. Um, kick drum. Uh, kick drum compression. I really like a thing called a vocal stressor. Orange County? Uh, Orange County was the original one, and then it was made by uh, um, Audio Design. Yeah. And... What's really great about that is it has a side chain of frequencies. You can make that thing do anything you could ever imagine and then some. Wow. Are we going to see a Jack Joseph Puig Orange County vocal compressor soon? Possibly. <laughs> Don't let me forget, he's got a, 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 a new line of stuff that just hit the marketplace today. I just got an email. About, we'll talk about that. I want, I want everybody to know that, that that's available. Uh, do, you, do you ever sub your drums, and if you do, what, what compressor would you choose just for a drum sub? Um, if I, I would use either the one I just mentioned or a Fairchild. Do you mean the Innovonics? Uh -huh, a Fairchild. No, not the Innovonics. Um, the Audio Design. Oh, okay. And I don't know if I just said that. I think I might have said it wrong. It's Audio Design I was talking about. 769 is Audio Design. Yeah. Um, you know, I kind of like, when you ask me these questions, I, I sort of feel like a deer in the headlights for a minute because... I, I can't pick one. Yeah, I'm you know? just saying. I'm just it saying. It's like, tough because I'm yeah. like, oh, but what about time you did this? And, yeah, I, and my yeah. mind's not going through the laundry list of all the choices. Absolutely. And then picturing the console, I'm going, that's not true. You're yeah. using this kind of compressor here, using this, using that, and, and so it's it's difficult. Yeah. I love mixing compression, as you very well know. A lot of yeah. us do that. I love mixing compression. 
on top of what we described mm -hmm. earlier in terms of the feel. Mm -hmm. Then on top of that, the multiple mixing compression channels mm -hmm. being summed together is another feel. Um, one more, and then I want to go back to that because that's a very important thing. Uh, obviously, vocals now. What, what's your go-to for that? Your Vocal first sound. First that comes to mind. Fairchild. Fairchild. Or um, ear. Oh, the EAR. Ron Fair likes that. Did you get that from Ron, or he got it from you? No, I got it from him. It's yeah. excellent. Yeah. You I have to you have to go through huge. them. They're, they're inconsistent. Yeah. Um, I've heard as many six or eight to pick one. Mm -hmm. There's one particular one I really like. But Are they still being made? I don't know the answer to that. Because we used that on Christina's first album. You talked about there's different ways to use compression. Obviously, you can just run the track through it and bring it back. But you like to actually mix. You like to use several compressors, malt that track, compress the track, and then mix that back in with the original. Michael does that a lot, Brower. That, that's, that's a technique you use a I lot. Think it's, I think it's real common amongst a lot of us. I mean, if you go back to earlier part of our conversation about the ratio, when you said more like a limiter where you raise it way high, mm -hmm. no matter where you go, I mean, obviously, as you get down to, you know, one or even lower than that or two, what I'm about ready to say doesn't apply quite as much, right? Mm -hmm. But when you start to get into the three and up, right, no matter what you choose in terms of attack or release, it's, it's not the original, right? Right. So if you have the original along with the alteration that you've made, the tailored alteration you've made, mm -hmm. now that's even another dynamic. Let me ask you this. When you... When you're doing that, is there a point at which it becomes parallel compression, or is it always parallel compression? Or like, like I just in my mind, I just made up a new definition for parallel compression. When you do a little too much to it, it becomes parallel. When you add it back in, if you're not doing too much, it's just another track that you're mixing with. That's kind of stupid, but I made that up. Write that down. Make sure that make sure well, that's remembered. Well, parallel my compression. Legacy. I mean, parallel compression. A hundred percent. Yeah, you you said it. Yes. That's interesting because at some point it's not really parallel compression. It's just it, it, it would be like just touching the EQ a little bit and adding a little. Like like you you mentioned that you took a Joe Meek that had the the high frequency boost on it and you just used that to kind of uh, add. Well, Gwen high Stefani yeah. wanted like air on this one song on her voice yeah. and she said, I just wanted it to sound like airy like I sang it with more air. Mm -hmm. You know and. Uh, so at the time, I remember I had these Joe Meeks, and they were kind of almost like an Aphex, you know, where if you could really extend them and really exaggerate that particular area. And I just had it on another fader, and I lifted it up, and she was like, that's it. That's what I'm hearing in my head. And that became a go-to from that point on. I've got to give her the credit. Yeah. Qu quick question. We've got a couple minutes before we go. Tell us, we were talking earlier before the show started, talk to us about your interest in the c consumer electronics side, and also about okay. the line that you got coming well, out. But the, the main... The, the consumer electronics side has two, two reasons drive me. Mm -hmm. um, the first reason that drives me is we work so hard, listen to everything we're talking about here, and we're just literally, we could sit here for another nine hours, I guarantee it. Definitely. We're just scratching Easily. the surface. Easily. We're just scratching the surface right. of how it all Which works. Which is why you have to come back. Right? <laughs> sure. Great. Um, and, and so anyway, um, we work so hard to create what we create, and then it comes out of this. Right. Or, you know, or it comes out of my Blackberry or right. my you know, my yeah. iPad or whatever, right? Yeah. And that's primarily how a lot of people are consuming the music. No question. So we don't have anybody who's going, who's concerned about end-to-end -end strategy. Mm -hmm. In other words, here's where it started, now we're gonna deliver it and put it in the system, but meanwhile, this ecosystem could care less about the sound. Mm -hmm. They have a retail price, right? And they gotta meet that retail price, or I should say that production price, so that the retail price that they ship it at has enough of a margin for them to make money. Right. I mean, that's their job. Right. So one cent in that world, two cent on a transducer from an OEM in, in Taiwan is a big deal. That's right. It's a huge, huge deal. Yeah. So the brain thinks, these people think how much money they're gonna put in the audio. It's like, do we have to spend any money? Can we just like, is there a way we can not spend any money on the audio? That's how they actually think. So I've been spending time going to these manufacturers explaining to them that, that they're not thinking right. And my pitch has been this, basic, effectively, that us as humans have five senses, right? And we're, when we're making a record, going back to my earlier part of the conversation, and you'll see how this connects, I'm not off on a tangent. Mm -hmm. When we go back to my earlier part of the conversation, 
I was talking about a, a, using another sense besides my ears, and, and that's was feel. Mm -hmm. how, it might have, how it felt when I was laying on the console, mm -hmm. what my feet were feeling off the floor. How your body reacts you know, to what How my skin was feeling what was coming out of the speaker. Yeah. That's another sense, right? Now, when we give the music for someone to listen to, we only get to appeal to one sense, which is this one, the ear, right? We don't get the smell. We don't get the touch. We don't get the taste. We don't get any of those. The gig gets them all. You go to the show and you get all two. The film people get two. They get the visual component and the audible component. So what I'm saying to the consumer electronics people is at the point that we're moving to 3D, that's telling you that the visual component, they feel like, has sort of escalated to the point like, I don't know how much better we can make it. You know, we're making the LCDs, we're doing this, we're doing that. Like, how much better can we make the visual component? So now we've got to make 3D. We've got to make something more crazy because we've pushed that to its envelope, sort of. And I'm saying to them, but you've left the other sense behind, which is the ear. Why would you do that? Your consumers can have two. You're concerned about the way the keyboard feels underneath their fingers. That's the touch, right? And you're always talking about the experience of the consumer, of that commodity, whatever it might be. Why are you not concerned about the audible part? Mm -hmm. That's like retarded mm -hmm. at best. Mm -hmm. That's not smart. Mm -hmm. So one is, that's my pitch to them, a very short, easy pitch. It's, it's much more involved than that, but we only have so much time on the sure. show. Mm -hmm. So the, the point of that is I want, I'd like to see these people think more about that and make the things sound better so that we can make these records and work really hard on them and then people can enjoy them. Because mm -hmm. that is part of the emotion of the, of the records that we make. Incredible. Right? And that's one lane. The other lane is the record uh, executive brain lane, mm -hmm. which is at the point that all of us are in the record business are asking the artists to give us a percentage, right, of their income. Mm -hmm. We want part of the keychain, we want part of the hat, we want part of the gig, we want part of the publishing. It's like, okay, and why? They asked the record company. And if I came to you and said, I'm Bank of America, I'm not doing well. So I'm gonna add five cents to every check you write you know, to kind of help us because we're in bad shape. I'd be like, I'm going to Mutual Washington. Watch the Mutual. I mean, what? I don't, what? That's your problem that right. you can't make your business work, right? So why should the record company say, we want all those things and give nothing back? Mm -hmm. It's always been my argument. Mm -hmm. So I am developing my relationships in those different verticals within this e-world. verticals, Herb. So that, so that I can give that to my artist mm -hmm. as something. You know what I mean? So if they're going to give up something, here's what I'm bringing to the table. Right. I'm not just taking it because my business sucks. Gotcha. Gotcha. Fantastic. You know, um, it, it warmed my heart to see Elliot Shiner advertising sound systems for Lexus. Did you, have you seen those ads where they talk about the Elliot Shiner system? Mm -hmm. That's that yes. parallels exactly yeah. what you're what you're talking about. That's pretty cool. The other thing uh, uh, that this brings to mind, you actually. Have, have made an effort to go to different radio stations and understand how their electronics work so that you can use that information to make records that are going to sound extra special on on radio stations mm -hmm. too. You've actually spent time yeah. learning and meeting. I've, I've done a little bit of that myself. I, I really think that's so important to know the guys at KISS FM, to know the guys at K-Rock, to know that, all those different people. Her brought up, um, and, and I was I got an email today from Waves and you, Chris, Tony, and um, uh, Eddie have uh, some new stuff out that looks pretty fascinating. Uh, I'm going to tell a little story. We were at AES. It was me, Jack Joseph, Maserati, and Manny. And it was the coolest thing. It wasn't, it was, it wasn't the biggest crowd, was it, Jack? So, so the four of us just did a show for each other. Mm. And to, to watch um, uh, Jack Joseph and Tony describe their plugins for waves and and it, it was just heartwarming because these guys they didn't slap that stuff together i mean they were jack was like moving his little fader for this and that and he was so excited and his reel that he was using as an example I had i'm listening to can i say it sure i'm listening to mick jagger's vocal solo and i'm listening to all these famous stars and jack is like showing them and i'm like uh, th this is a once in a lifetime experience. It, it, it really, it really changed me as an engineer to see the passion with which you were so proud of every nuance of your plug-in. And I'm sure that these new plugins, the drum ones, and and and, and I forget what the other drum and vocal, right? It's drum and bass that they've uh, pulled out of. Uh, they've created a bundle where they've put us together and taken the drum and bass and put it in one bundle. 
Okay. And then there was another one. Was it was it for vocals? It was, there was two. No, it's just drum and bass. If you're thinking about the the newest one, uh, they call it drum and bass. I'm pretty pretty. Yeah, damn sure I know that one was, but I thought there was I thought there was another one that came out simultaneously. But uh, you might be thinking of one knob, but that that's but not to do with us. That's a waves. Yeah, I like the one knob. I think that's a great idea. By I the way, I do 100 uh, percent. But if anybody thinks that 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 that, that these things are just attempts to to make money by someone in the process, you're wrong. Well, let me just say, we don't make money. It's, it's not a money thing at all. I it's 100, 100%. For me, with my plugins, and the only thing I want to say about them is I really wanted to, to take care of the laptop artist and the LE operator. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who doesn't have the, the good fortune to work in a great record studio that I, I have that fortune. I'm very fortunate. So I wanted to be able for them to have those kinds of plugins that are made by tool, with tools that are you know, extremely expensive tools that you could never find that are rare or hard to find packaged in a digital situation so they get the benefit of it. Right. You right. know? Right. And they get the benefit of many years of experience of you with that fader up, that's like 20 years of experience. Yeah. You know, yeah. on one fader. Wow. And they get that. Yeah. And, and then that means they get to work on the songs. Right. Incredible. Mm -hmm. you look at that? Yeah. So. Oops. What a fantastic hour. <laughs> I mean, Man. I mean, incredible. I've learned so much. Uh, let, let me let me do a little bit of homework before we uh, get out of here. First of all, Alex and Vintage King, we've been watching the chat room. You've been rocking it. Thank you. Thanks for coming on board, Vintage King. We are going to do some great things together. Um, our page isn't up, so let me just, you know our information. Our Twitter handle is at Pensado's Place. Um, then our email is Pensado's Place at thisweekend.com. Clearly, Facebook is where we see and meet you all the time, so make sure you get there. You know our stuff will be up on the YouTube page. Thanks, Drew, for handling the chat room. Thanks, Alex, for being in the chat room. Thanks, Jack, for coming. Personally, oh, there's our page with, with all of our information up. So make sure you get information to us, and we'll get information where it needs to go. Um, uh, Dave is going to ask you this anyways, but I'm going to ask you personally if you'd ever come back or do an ITL or you know, all those just such fascinating information. And even for me, who's not in it as you guys are in it, it's just lovely to to hear that information and we'll maybe we'll talk about our Facebook Google discussion on air next time that we okay. have beforehand um, back to you compadre Jack Joseph said I believe in the romance of making records that says it all I mean I'm gonna take that quote with me to the grave uh, I uh, music is, is a spiritual thing it, it started out as a way to praise God and it's, it's, it's morphed and changed throughout the years but there's always an emotional component to music no matter if you've got a political cause you're trying to get through your music or if you're just pissed off because a girl broke your heart or if you're upset because you grew up in a particular place and, and it's provided a, a hell of a life for you it's a great way to express your feelings and your emotion and, and there's these little monsters along the way that try to eat those feelings and subvert those feelings and reduce those feelings and and to see the, the effort with which Jack Joseph has, has, has put into Make sure, make sure that we feel those feelings that the artist has put into that work and the musicians and everybody along the, the path and line is something that if, if that's all you take away from today's show then you're going to be a better engineer for that. I know, I know I'm going to be a better engineer just, just talking with Jack and having him as my friend and I appreciate you coming on my pal. Uh, Jack had a little trouble getting here and not at one time did he ever hesitate. Uh, in fact he Drew picked him up. He was hitchhiking on the 210, wasn't he, Drew? Yeah, he had a nice sign, so I figured I'd pick him up. <laughs> Jack blew a tire on his car coming in today. That's why we were a little bit late. But, man, from the bottom of my heart, thank you, Jack Joseph. And uh, uh, a shout-out to our buddy Ron Fair and all the future has in store for him. Can't wait to hear how, how Ron's uh, situation plays out. I know it's going to be spectacular. Herb, as always, thanks. Great. My wingman, my and, friend. And my friend as well, too. Cool. And Drew, my favorite person to tease. We got a lot of work to do this week, Drew. You yeah, got that mix to finish. I got a couple to finish. So, yeah, you do. coming by later on this afternoon? Yeah, for sure. All right. All right, guys. Once again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for following us. Uh, Vintage King is with us now. So, um, I want you guys to check out their website and uh, tell them we sent you. It's a great source of information and uh, it, it will save you money. And if you got them in your corner, you, you, you've got a real good partner. So next week, Herb. Good oh, night. can I say one thing? Quickly. Uh, yesterday, Herb and, and Will and I went over to Tricky Stewart's studio, and we filmed Tricky Stewart 
and Tricky will be our guest next week. Uh, it's, it's, uh, um, I think you're going to enjoy that episode too to get into the uh, into into the mind of a, a creative person like Tricky. Hey, Will, we'll have that ready for next week, right? Sure. Yep. You've, Will's already started on it, and and he said it's going to be a very informative show. And then we've got a couple of surprises guest wise uh, later on down the road. Uh, I, I don't want to put anybody on the spot or embarrass anybody, but I've spoken to some people that if, if, if when they get the time to come through, it's going to be great. The guys that I'm getting on the show work for a living, guys, so sometimes they might not make it. Sometimes they have obligations, but th these are the people you want to see, and it turns out these are the people that are that are the most in demand. So we've got to be patient, and every once in a while you might get stuck with a question and answer show by me. But anyway, thanks, guys. Bye.